So what is Clean and Abundant Water Lobby Week? Um, I believe, I wanna say, correct me if I'm wrong, this is our second year doing this, um, but it's basically just a way for you, which is the public, to engage with your legislators um, on issues affecting Washington's waters. So how that works is, so how that works is water keeper um, organizations and other just water focused environmental organizations will come together and identify what pieces of legislation are really crucial for us to pass this year. Um, and then we educate constituents, which is you guys on the bills, which is this training here. Um, and then we connect you with your legislators so that you can have your voice heard. Um, it's gonna be looking a little different this year if you participated last year, um, especially with COVID and just everything being on Zoom. Um, but this year the budget is gonna be a big um, consideration in the policy determination because it is the only thing they're required to do this session. Um, their top priorities right now are of course COVID relief and they're also really focused on racial justice, budget and climate. Um, and because this is the first virtual session, there are gonna be fewer bills passed. Um, and the reason that that is, it's, a, it's more accessible for people to join, which is great, but it means that um, the pace is slower and there are less bills introduced and um, there's gonna be less hearings for the bills. Um, and this is also going to be a new experience for the legislative aides, the legislators, and all of us as well. This is the first time um, that the legislative session has uh, ever been virtual. So this is a learning curve for all of us. So if you feel kind of lost, that is okay. We are all figuring it out. And this is just a throwback to last year. If you attended Clean and Abundant Water Lobby Week, we all gathered together and carpooled when it wasn't a public health crisis and went down to Olympia. Um, and we had a really good time. We were able to meet with some legislators that is um, Sharon Shoemake and she's in the 42nd, 42nd at the top. Um, and then Senator Liz Lovelet. And I'm not sure who this is, but yeah, we had a really good time. Hopefully fingers crossed by next year, we will be able uh, to lobby in person. So now we're gonna go over an overview of the bills. So there are four bills we're focusing on this year and that's gonna be um, a ban on seabed mining. Um, we wanna see a plastics and styrofoam ban. There's gonna be a gray water recycling bill and the Nooksack River adjudication funding. So we're gonna start with seabed mining and that is gonna be presented by Twin Harbors Waterkeeper. So Lee, go ahead and take it away. All right, Th thank you, Destiny. This is Lee First, your Twin Harbors Waterkeeper. And I'm also here with Sue Jorger, my co-waterkeeper. Um, so we are so excited about this bill. We, we have a really good feeling about it. And we, um, we're so glad you've signed up to help us with this. Um, we've testified in the first hearing that this was held in. Um, in early January, and so um, and and we've been traveling um, well, virtual traveling all over uh, Western Washington, talking to groups about this, um, trying to raise the awareness of it. So you know, the the main reason that that we want this bill to pass is it, it would cause a huge amount of harm. It would be devastating to aquatic life and the damage caused would last for a very long time. You know, on land, we've figured out how to restore sites that we've ruined. You know, we have pretty successful restoration sites, um, but in the deep sea, we have no idea how to, how, how to restore the damage caused, absolutely no idea. And then um, another really important thing is seabed mining could worsen climate change by releasing carbon stored in the deep sea sediments. And so, um, yeah, so there's a whole bunch of other things here. It would, you know, the impacts could affect um, whales, southern resident killer whales, um, really valuable fish species, you know, salmon migrations. Um, the, the activity is just very, um, it, 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 creates a sediment plume that blocks and light, causes a lot of noise, you know, just a huge amount of damage. And, um, and I can, if anyone asks questions about the damage, I, I can talk to you s s separately. It's just, just a devastating thing. Okay, next. 
So what the bill does, the main thing it does is it changes the law that currently allows for the Washington DNR to issue aquatic leases for hard mineral mining. So the DNR is the agency that um, would permit this type of activity in Washington state waters. And that is the high extreme high tide to three miles out. So that's the zone we're talking about. Past three miles out, this bill does nothing. But it's really, really important to, um, to protect our nearshore waters. Um, and this bill is pretty far reaching. It includes the Washington coast, um, Grace Harbor, Willapa Bay, um, most of the Columbia River Delta. It also prohibits mining in the Strait of Juan de Fuca and the Salish Sea under the Shoreline Management Act. So the Shoreline Management Act would, would be slightly tweaked to, um, to prohibit the, this kind of mining. So you can see in, in number three here, hard minerals include metals and placer deposits, uh, non-metallic minerals, gemstones, ores, gold, silver, copper, and so on. So that's really the gist of it. You, you know, it's, this hasn't happened, you know, we haven't had this kind of mining. So we're kind of getting ahead of the game here, which is a, a lot easier than trying to stop it once it starts. And we, um, the state of Oregon banned this in 1991. And the state of California is, is also working on this now. Um, so we have a good chance of of stopping this hugely damaging activity on the whole West Coast before it starts. So really appreciate your attention to this and I'm really looking forward to the meetings next week and I'm trying to keep it brief. So if, if you have any questions, um, fire away, I'll try to answer them. Yes, folks, if you have any questions, thank you, Sue, for that. That was great. If you have any questions at all, go ahead and drop them in the chat. We'll like take a pause after every bill, make sure that we all understand, um, and we'll move on. So any questions? So who are the parties who are interested in defeating this, in defeating this bill? Um, so this, I, this, oh, go ahead, go ahead. Well, the only senator that was that registered con in the in the committee hearing was Honeycutt. Um, and to be honest, I don't know much about him. I think um, there, there's a lot of momentum for this bill. I think, you know, we think it's going to pass. So, you know, I don't have any, any, I'm sorry, I can't answer, answer that question. No, you're good. Um, somebody just wanted to see this slide one more time looking at the harm. Oh. And don't worry, we're going to be sending um, all of these talking points, everything and a recording of the presentation afterwards um, to folks. I would assume that Erickson would would be a con here. It, do you guys have meetings with with him set up? We do not have meetings with Erickson. No. Okay. okay. All right, well, thank you for that, Sue. Okay, we're gonna move on here to the plastic pollution and recycling bill, and that is gonna be presented by me. <laughs> so some background on the plastic pollution and recycling bill. I believe that we lobbied on something similar to this last year, um, but the background is pretty self-explanatory. So polystyrene foam, AKA styrofoam, um, is made from finite non-renewable natural gas and oil resources. Obviously we don't like that. Um, Plastic waste and styrofoam frequently end up as litter. It breaks down and does not readily biodegrade. If you have ever attended one of our beach cleanups or any beach cleanup at all, you know that you can pick up pounds of plastic in just a single outing, um, especially once it breaks down into microplastics. Microplastics are incredibly difficult to clean, if not impossible, but like incredibly difficult to clean and really costly. Um, it ends up in the stomachs and gills of wildlife and fish. Um, it can also end up in things like our table salt, in our beer, in our stomachs, which is gross. We don't want that. Um, 
And then especially during COVID when the usage of single takeout or single use takeout containers is higher than normal, we really wanna be mindful and careful about how much waste we're generating. Um, and we wanna minimize that as much as we can. So what this bill does, um, oh, sorry, I'm on the wrong slide here. Um, so what this does is requires plastic beverage containers to contain a minimum of 15% recycled plastic by 2023, 25% by 2026, and 50% by 2031. Um, so progressively as time goes on, what that basically means is we're going to be producing um, less newly produced plastic to make these things. We want to start making them out of recycled materials so that we're producing less. Um, plastic utensils, straws, and lids will only be provided by request um, or in self-serve bins, which means if it's not necessary for us to, um, you know, take those little forks and things like that, we don't have to and they won't be provided to us unless we ask specifically. Um, and then it also incorporates a ban on styrofoam packing peanuts, coolers, food service products. Um, and take out clamshells as of June 2023. So it's not going to be effective immediately, but um, two years from now, we're hoping to see just a ban on those, especially since um, a lot of the big styrofoam pieces or like packing peanuts aren't accepted um, in curbside recycling. But that is the gist of this bill. We are pro this bill. We want to see styrofoam and newly made plastics banned. Um, does anybody have any questions about this bill? All right, we're looking good, okay. So we're gonna move on to the next bill and that is gonna be the gray water recycling bill and that's gonna be presented by the Center for Environmental Law and Policy, AKA, Kel oh, okay, we do have a question. Sorry, we're going back, we're going back folks. Um, is there a reason why you can't go to 25% earlier? Mm, that is an excellent question. Full disclosure, I am not uh, the strongest policy person so I, don't necessarily know, but I imagine um, it's just easier for these production companies to just phase out. Um, I imagine it probably has to do with um, cost and yeah, that's that's my best guess. If anybody else has um, an explanation for that, let me know, but I will address that in a follow-up email for sure. And then where does the restaurant industry stand on the plastic spill? Um, so again, that's not something that I am entirely sure of. I would imagine that there may be some pushback, um, you know, just given that um, I'm not sure about the cost of alternatives, of like compostable alternatives. Um, I imagine that might be a bit more costly. So there may be some pushback, but I am not entirely sure. Again, any questions that I'm not able to answer, I will definitely answer in the follow-up email. Um, do we have any more questions about this plastic spill? All right, moving along to gray water recycling bill with kelp. Uh, great, thanks, Destiny. Um, my name is Dan Von Segern. I'm the staff attorney at the Center for Environmental Law and Policy, or kelp, and I don't know if everybody here knows who we are. We are the state's nonprofit, which is concerned with water quantity. We want to keep water in the streams. We want to keep the habitat there for the fish. And we are really quite interested in managing um, and making sure people, people wisely use water. So this gray water recycling bill is really a water conservation bill. This is HB 1184. Uh, we are strongly pro on this, and the bill has passed the House by a vote of 90 to 6. So I, um, I don't know who voted no, but it, it's obviously got broad support. So what this bill is about is using the water we have more wisely. And population is increasing here all the time. Demand for water is going up, and it's getting very, very difficult to find new supplies for cities and towns for municipal use. Um, and... Part of the problem is that we take water, we take pristine water from the source, <clears throat> excuse me, we treat it and we use the same water for all purposes, whether you're drinking it or flushing a toilet or irrigating the garden or whatever, it's all the same clean treated potable water. What this bill is about is taking water from 
that comes from plumbing fixtures or from rainwater and also storm runoff, which has to be treated in some way anyway. And treating that water and using it again for non-potable uses. We're not talking about drinking um, effluent water or anything like that here. We're talking about treating it uh, through systems which would be developed under the rules this bill would, would set up and using it for non-potable things, flushing your toilet, irrigating, um, landscaping, that sort of thing. What this will do is reuse the overall demand for potable water. Cities have to produce less purified clean water. They'll take less from the rivers and the wells. So this is, um, I think what Destiny's added here is exactly right. Let's reserve our fresh clean water for drinking and washing and try and do something more sensible with the rest of it. And finally, this is, um, and I, I think common sense approach is a great term to use for this. And it's being used in a lot of other states and countries already. There's, um, uh, we'd like to see it applied here. Destiny, if you can go to the next slide. Do we have a next slide? Yeah. Okay, so what the, what the bill actually does is it, it looks a little wonky when you first read it, but what it does is it creates a path for on-site treatment and reuse of water, either at the building scale or even at the development scale. And one thing that's been discussed is if you have a developer with a group of buildings in a given area, can they set up a plan to do this? What it would do is tell the Department of Health, which has jurisdiction over these types of uses, to set up standards. So if you want to reuse your gray water, your rainwater, your storm water, and some combination of those, what do you have to do? What sort of a system do you need to set up? And it works on a risk reduction idea. So they're not going to tell you exactly what plumbing to install, but they're going to set up rules that say you must uh, achieve this much removal of things like uh, bacteria and viruses and that sort of thing. And it'd be a, uh, they call it a performance-based standard. And again, the gray water here would be used for non-potable things, flushing the toilets, ir irrigating the landscape, um, possibly some exterior washing and that sort of thing, and be used on site so that less clean fresh water has to flow into all those sites. And is there one more slide on this? There is not. That's the last. Just, okay. Did you have anything else? So anyway, that that's um. That's in a nutshell what we do. It's a relatively simple concept. I, I'm kind of dismayed it hasn't been done earlier in the state here. The bill has passed the House, so we'll be, we'll be thanking any House members for their support on this. Um, hopefully they did support this. And we'll be asking senators to advance this, get it a vote on the floor and pass it through. Um, if you have any questions, I can take them now. I'm also happy to talk to anybody before the meetings next week if you want to get in touch with me. Yeah, we have a question. Um, if you know, what are opponents saying about this bill? I don't think they're saying very much. I testified on this bill when it went through the House committee, and I think there was no formal opposition at that point. Um, uh, it's got the support also of the, uh, the pipe fitters, you know, the people that do plumbing and so on. And of course, they, they do have the um, incentive to support it in that it would obviously create jobs for their people but it's you know they're the ones who know how this stuff works and uh, I spoke to somebody from Seattle Public Utilities a couple of weeks ago at length and they're strongly supportive I don't think there's any organized opposition again that vote in the house shows the support's pretty overwhelming okay and then we have another question so is it just a guidance for developers and builders to follow it's not an actual requirement Correct. Um, correct. And it's, uh, I would call it a establishing an opportunity. Right now, there's no legal framework that lets you do this. And you can't just start taking the water out of your sinks and doing something with it and putting it back into your plumbing system and running it down the toilet. So the health department, which has jurisdiction over uh, drinking water and other water use, has to set up standards and rules to allow you to do that. And what this would do is direct the health department to set up those standards. So if somebody wants to do this, they can do it. Uh, there is an incentive for developers to do it in that right now, if you clear some land, put up some buildings, put in hard surfaces and things, you're gonna create runoff of stormwater and you need to manage that so that it's not running off to a greater degree than it was before the development. And the bill in its amended form to pass the house would allow credit towards that amount of water treatment for whatever gets reused inside because you're running less water. If you collect your stormwater or your rainwater and run it through the plumbing fixtures, that's less treatment they have to do outside the buildings, but it's not a requirement. And this hopefully will be seen as a 
cost saving measure and as a way to manage both water demand and stormwater. Thank you. Do we have any more questions on that? These are great questions. <clears throat> All right. Well, let's go ahead and move on to the next bill, which is going to be the Nooksack River Adjudication Funding Bill, and that is also going to be presented by Cal. Right. And of course, as you can see, we all go way back now. You know who I am. Um, and this is a bill to not to do an adjudication for the Nooksack River, but to get the preliminary work started. And let me back up a bit and talk about what an adjudication is, why we would want to do it, why that's important. So water use in Washington operates on the prior appropriation system, like all the other Western states. And that basically means whoever got the water first gets to use it. And this goes back to way before we were a state and way before there was any modern record keeping. And you used to be able to establish a right to use water by something as simple as nailing a notice to a tree, saying, I, John Smith, am going to take uh, two miners' inches or whatever the old unit of water out of this stream and use it on my fields or use it in my mine here. You bang it up there. And, uh, and then that you're supposed to have the right to use the water over and above anybody who comes later. So it's all about seniority. And you, you can imagine what happened is lots and lots of people claimed a lot of water use. Some of those have been turned into issued actual water rights in more of the modern era. But we don't really know in most river systems exactly how many water rights are out there and how many of them are valid. And a complicating factor on the Nooksack is that there's been a lot of illegal water use. And there are places where people have just stuck pipes in the river with no formalities at all. And the problem there is that this is draining the river down to where it's not supporting fish. And the Nooksack is a really important salmon river. The Lummi Nation and the Nooksack tribe both have treaty rights to fish there. And I'd also add that fish produced in the Nooksack, of course, go out into the sound and out in the ocean, and they contribute to the pool of fish that's available for fishermen generally and for uh, animals like the orcas that need them. And so it's really important that that treaty right to fish, now it really includes that there's enough water there to support the fish habitat. Now, we don't know how much water exactly that is, but it's enough to keep a, a healthy fish population. And when there's not enough water, um, salmon don't do well for a variety of reasons. Sometimes they physically can't swim upstream to their spawning grounds. The rivers will be just too low. Sometimes the water temperature is too high because flows are low. There may not be water present to help the young fish get downstream. So if we keep draining these rivers, we're going to run into real problems with the fish. Um, right now, um, again, the Nooksack, it's a little bit like the Wild West. And what the adjudication would do is clarify who has access to water. Who has a lawful water, right? How much water they're entitled to use, what their priority date is. So um, what that tells you is when the river starts to get low, who gets cut off in what order. It, it makes the system fair. It protects existing property right holders because water rights are treated as property rights here. It protects people who are legally using water and it protects the river. And um, it's a way to uh, avoiding or minimizing conflict in the river. And I think there's one more slide here. Uh, correct or no? Um, yes. Okay. And um, what this bill does is pretty simple. An adjudication is a huge deal. And the way an adjudication works is uh, the Department of Ecology will start a, ca a case in the Superior Court. Here in Washington, the Superior Courts, the county courts, are the entity that can decide whether a water right's really valid or not. So Ecology starts a case, and they bring everyone into it who says they have a water right on the system. And if you don't show up at the adjudication and argue for your right to use water, you're gonna be shut out. So you can imagine there's thousands of parties on a case like this. Uh, we did an adjudication over on the Yakima, which started in 1977, I think, and it just finished basically this year. So these can be huge deals. <laughs> a lot of effort, a lot of resources for ecology, some resources for the court, it's a, it's a big thing. And what this bill would do is provide about a million dollars to start the initial work to get going on that. They need to figure out, um, you know, to really confirm that the Nooksack is the next river we're gonna do. They need to start 
deciding how many water rights there are, generate a listing of people, do the initial groundwork to get started on the adjudication. So it's not a ton of money, but it's important that they get going down this path and they can begin the actual process. Um, and we're asking that the legislature provide the money so that they can do that. Again, this is supportive not only of the tribes and the tribal rights, it's supportive of the fish populations generally and supportive of the, the orcas. Um, I see a question, how far does that 1 million go? How soon will they need to provide more? I don't know exactly the answer to that. My guess would be in the next budget cycle, they'd be looking for increasing funding to do this. Um, ecology is going to come up with a number of FTEs. They need to do the work and there'll be other entities also that are gonna need some money. I would imagine after this, um, if this is funded after this year's work, they'll know better what that'll be. But I would expect this would be a, at least a several million dollar process overall. And you know, again, we're cognizant that this is a tough budget year. And I think it's fortunate that this is the year we're not asking for a ton of money to do this. Um, right, any other questions? Okay, I think that is all for the, oh, wait, we have, um, is there a way to speed up the process given that the last one took over 40 years? Um, yeah, there certainly is. And of course, part of it is record keeping is a little more complete now. And I would imagine things are better computerized and better automated than they were 40 years ago. And I don't know how much that'll speed this process up, but it, it, it can't hurt, you know, ecologies probably going to have to do less going through filing boxes and more looking at digital files. You'd have to ask them how much that's going to help. Uh, the Akama adjudication, which is the one I was talking about, is also, it's big. That's a very big agricultural area, as I'm sure you all know. And there were some complications there. There's some federal water projects. And uh, there were um, uh, the Yakima tribe, excuse me, Yakima Nation has not only fishing rights and treaty rights, they also had their own water rights for the reservation use. And there were a number of um, categories of those. It's, I think that's probably on the large end of the adjudications. The Nooks Act should be somewhat less complicated than that, we hope, fingers crossed. Um, but we'd love to see these speed up. Really the way to get a handle on water use in Washington is to adjudicate everywhere. And that's obviously a lot of work. All right, do we have any more questions? All right, sounds good. Hey. Hey. Again, don't hesitate to get in touch if you do have particular questions about all this. Yes, absolutely, okay. All right, well, now is the time that I set aside for us to take a break, but we are speeding right along. I think we can keep this to an hour. So we will go ahead and keep going. Um, so this next section of the presentation is gonna be a lobbying 101. Um, sorry, we're gonna go back. We have a question. Will we be mentioning this bill to both house members and senators to support funding for adjudication? Dan, are you there? Oh, hey, I'm muted. Look at that, and shut up. Um, I believe without having seen any update, um, this still needs to be addressed in both houses, and we would be talking to both of them. Um, I do not think there will be any action on a budget by either house before we're in talking to them. Um, and on that note, the, the other thing to point out is that the um, Colville tribes have also uh, requested adjudication for um, they're part of Lake Roosevelt, which is part of the Columbia River behind Grand Coulee Dam. So you may hear mention of the Colville adjudication, and I believe that's in just about the same position as this one, funding-wise. Thank you. Uh, Ayla, do you know anything different about that? Not sure about the Colville. Yeah, let me let me look into that. But you may someone may mention the Colville. They may say, hey, hey what about the Colville? So that's um that's the other um, ecology did a study this last year to look at which basins were probably the best ones to adjudicate, and those are the two they came up with, and they strongly want to 
to do those and we're strongly supportive of those. All right. Okay, we're gonna keep going, but feel free to keep the questions coming. Um, so this is the Lobbying 101. And I know a lot of you have already lobbied before and that is fantastic. Um, you may be wondering why even meet with the legislators? Um, well, legislators need to see the human faces of key environmental issues. At any given moment, they could have a number of bills in front of them and they may not necessarily be an expert in every single one of those bills. Um, so if you come along and you're like, hey, this bill is really important and this is why, suddenly it's more on their radar and they're like, okay, let me pay attention to this. Um, it shows that you and the other constituents are watching and will hold their votes accountable. Um, as their constituents, you hold a lot of power. Obviously, these are our elected officials and they know that these are the people who are voting for them. So once you go and meet with them, you're no longer just a number or a nameless constituent. You are here and you're like, I'm a voting constituent and these are the things that are important to me and you are my um, elected official, obviously politely, you know, but um, and on that note, you can vote or you as their constituent can influence um, where they stand for every reason I just mentioned. Um, okay, so how to be an effective advocate. Um, so you're going to want to stay on message when you're meeting with your legislators. I know that some folks can be a bit long winded and be like, oh, like, and also this and also this and also this, but we really wanna make sure that we are staying focused on the four bills um, that we mentioned before. So make sure that you read through your one pagers, um, read through your one pagers, run over them with your team. We're gonna be having um, a prep session prior to these meetings. So you'll be able to kind of like go through it. Um, you're gonna wanna share your story, which honestly I think is the most important part. Um, this is what grabs legislators and what stays in their minds and on their hearts. Um, after a bunch of meetings, um, not everybody's gonna remember all the details and the facts that you spew out at them, but if you have a personal story, um, then those are the things that tend to stick out. Lobbying isn't necessarily about, um, it's about getting the bill in front of them and getting the facts in front of them and why they should support it. But even more than that, it's like telling your own personal story and why it matters to you. Um, and then you're going to want to make sure that you get a yes or a no. Um, I know that in the, in the heat of the moment, especially if you've never lobbied before, you can get nervous and kind of forget like, oh, I need to make sure that I ask, like, will they support this bill that we're talking about? But make sure that you ask if they're going to support the bill. And even if they try and like kind of give a run around or if they waffle, that's okay. Just follow, like we'll follow up with them um, in about a week or so to check on it. But you do want to make sure that you ask um, if they will support the bill. So how to be an effective advocate in your lobby groups. So again, you're going to want to prepare, look over those one pagers, make sure that you, um, you know, practice your story and what you're going to want to say. Um, there are typically roles in lobbying, so you have like your leader and your facilitator, and that is already um, determined in your lobby groups. Every group will have a leader and a facilitator. And um, there's gonna be a note taker who's taking notes on what's happening. Um, and then the storytellers, which hopefully <clears throat> most of you will be, which is, this is why this bill is important to me and this is why I care so much about it. Um, especially when it comes to lobbying, it's really easy to like send out a tweet or send an email, but you, um, in particular have decided like I want to meet face to face with these legislators and you want to do that for a reason you're obviously very passionate and you like um, are really invested so you want to tell that story. Um, the timekeeper which will most likely be your facilitator is just there to make sure that we are keeping time everybody has a chance to speak. Um, and then the asker it can be helpful um, again just to have one person designated to be like can we count on your support for this bill? Um, and then again, practice, um, try and keep it short. We may have um, several several people in a meeting and we wanna make sure that everybody gets a chance to speak. So try and keep it under two minutes um, and just practice, practice, practice. You want it to be organized and smooth. Um, and yes, just make sure that you're able to identify everybody in the Zoom. So these are some tips for lobbying and we're gonna give a more in depth, um, you'll receive a PDF with these lobbying tips and more. Um, dress is business casual, at least on the top. 
business casual. We want to show that we're serious. Um, you know, don't worry about putting on like a full suit or anything like that, but you do just want to make sure that you look presentable and ready to meet your lawmakers. Um, be mindful of your background and your noise now. With everything being on Zoom, like it's it's understandable if you can't control the noise. Um, just make sure that you're muted when you're not speaking so that that noise isn't getting picked up. And just be aware of your backgrounds. <laughs> and yeah, I'll just say that. Um, so treat everybody with respect. Don't argue with legislators um, and stick to the message. That is really important. We're not there to um, strong arm them and to you know, agreeing with us or accepting our stance, but we are just there to communicate um, the bills. So just treat everyone with respect um, and treat AIDS as you would your legislator, especially important this time because um, almost all of these meetings scheduled are gonna be with legislative aides. They're not gonna be with the legislators. Um, this upcoming week is a really busy floor week and a lot of folks couldn't make the actual meetings, but we're gonna be meeting with the legislative aides and then just leaving behind like a brief one pager so that they have everything they need. So again, you're gonna to wanna to keep it short, two minutes or less uh, and the group lead, your facilitator most likely or whoever speaks first. Um, you just wanna make sure that you identify yourself as a volunteer with Clean and Abundant Water Lobby Week um, which organization you're with. So if that's resources or Twin Harbor or Kelp or whoever recruited you um, and thank them for ask or for making the time to meet with you. So those are just some lobbying tips. And again, if you have any questions at all during this, feel free to drop them in the chat. On one sec, do we have? No, we're good. Okay, perfect. All right, so now we're gonna take a peek at the lobby schedule so far. So things are always subject to change, but you can see um, we have meetings scheduled Monday through Friday. Um, you're going to want to look for your legislative district. If you don't see your legislative district, that's totally fine. It could be that um, your facilitator hasn't gotten the info to me yet, but it's most likely taken care of. But this is just so you can kind of see the schedule that we have. So I will leave this up for a brief second. Dustin, are we leaving digital documents with the legislators? Yes, we are. We are leaving behind one pagers. Um, with the aides and with the legislators so that they can read over this information. Which again, all the more reason why your story is the most important piece. We can leave behind the facts and the numbers for them and they can see for themselves. Um, but the story really is the most important piece. Destiny, here's a stupid mechanical question. Oh, please. Um, but are we, um, is there a way to do that in Zoom other than just emailing it to somebody? Is there like a drag and drop thing to hand people things or? Oh, so um, either your facilitator or myself will be emailing after the meeting. So no, okay, need, to, no need to drag and drop anything during Zoom. It'll all be sent after, um, after the meetings. Got it. Thanks. 